Of course, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit uh, piece of music uh, for the next speaker. Uh, that is the Martial World Transhumanism, given by Gennady Kudaro. Second, Boeing will be our. Who will be our next speaker? Gennady is uh, at the moment uh, chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Uh, editor of uh, Electronic Journal, Rational Trans, uh, Rational Argumentator. Uh, he had uh, a great uh, contribution to uh, organize the development of um, uh, the second version of the, the Trans uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, by the way, with the matrix of uh, rank correlation. Uh, close to our hearts. Uh, in uh, our uh, great transhumanist game, he will act as a character under the name the Rational Argumentator. Also, he is a composer. This much is his uh, small contribution, but he is writing a big symphony. Let me introduce uh, Gennady Stolaro the second. Thank you very much, Professor Marchev, for your excellent introduction. I am honored to speak to all of you today. And I think this is one excellent example of transhumanism that we are experiencing right now. In the 1970s and 1980s, the proto-transhumanist thinker FM2030 was writing about the technologies of what he called telepresence, where one would be able to remotely participate in conversations in different places around the world on the same day. And that's essentially what we're doing right now. We are engaging in telepresence. So since FM2030's days, transhumanism has evolved and the subjects of discourse in transhumanism have shifted as well. My topic today is quite broad, transhumanism contemporary issues, but on the second slide I distill these issues to a more manageable subset for the time that I have today and I'd like to focus on three major controversies in the areas of artificial intelligence, religion, and privacy. And these are controversies that exist both within transhumanist circles and within the general public discourse on these subjects, as you will see. With regard to artificial intelligence, there are some people who worry about it perhaps posing an existential risk or a threat to jobs and the livelihoods of a lot of people. But on the other hand, there are people who are making a strong case that artificial intelligence may not be as much of a risk as it would be a boon to humankind. With regard to religion, there are various perspectives about whether or not it is compatible with transhumanism and the pursuit of life extension. And with regard to privacy, especially as it interacts with emerging technologies, the key question to ask is, is privacy dead, or rather, can emerging technologies rescue it? So on my next slide, I present quotations from various leading thinkers regarding artificial intelligence. If you are seeing the quotations regarding artificial intelligence, I'm not going to read each of them directly, but hopefully each of you will have access to them afterward, and you will also be able to follow the links to the source articles. But for instance, Elon Musk famously is concerned about competition among nations for superiority in artificial intelligence development, and he has stated that he worries this may trigger World War III, including by the decision of an AI rather than a human deciding that a preemptive strike is best. With regard to whether or not artificial intelligence could follow a kind of recursive 
pathway to its own improvement that runs outside of the scope of humans to control. Stephen Hawking has been concerned about that. And Zoltan, whom you just heard, expressed a concern that if automation and artificial intelligence, for instance, in driverless trucks, renders the jobs of 3.5 million American truck drivers obsolete, what are they going to do? Are they going to quietly resign themselves to that, or are they going to put up a resistance that endangers peace and social order? And furthermore, Scott Santens, who is a leading advocate of the universal basic income, wishes to transcend the entire model of paid employment as the primary means for people to earn a living and instead have a universal unconditional basic income that doesn't depend on whether one receives other sources of income. So those are the perspectives that try to portray artificial intelligence and automation in somewhat threatening terms. On the other hand, Ben Goetzel, who is a leading AI researcher, recognizes that there's some logical foundation to the arguments for existential risk from AI, which thinkers like Nick Bostrom and Eliezer Yudkowsky also made. But he considers those arguments to essentially pertain to an extreme case that isn't a necessary outgrowth of AI development. It seems to presuppose that artificial intelligence would be designed in a particular way just to maximize a certain objective or uh, a certain reward, but that is not a necessary way for AI to be designed. And rather, he says that when one sees past, current, and future intelligence is open-ended, the potential dangers no longer appear to loom so large, and one sees a future that is wide open, complex, and uncertain, just as it has always been. So I would see Ben Goetzel's perspective as kind of more of a continuation of our present reality, where we do have large-scale uncertainties, but we do not have the certainty of doom arising from any given technology. Likewise, Rollo Carpenter, who is the creator of Cleverbot, stated, I believe we will remain in charge of the technology for a decently long time, and the potential of it to solve many of the world problems will be realized. So he thinks AI is not going to run away from our ability to control it. And Alston Gaforafar, the CEO and founder of the company Entify cited a study that showed that in the UK, at least for the recent past, artificial intelligence and automation technologies may have eliminated 800,000 low-skilled jobs, but at the same time created 3.5 million new jobs, which means that for now, we are still having a net gain of jobs from automation and in my view, those are the more creative jobs, the more interesting jobs that people can move up to if there's no longer a need for the more rote or menial kinds of tasks. Instead, people's time is freed up to pursue more interesting endeavors and perhaps more remunerative endeavors as well. And then we have Zoltan also on this side of the artificial intelligence debate saying it might be wise for us to put ourselves in the hands of a machine intelligence that can take the best decision for the greatest amount of people. That's what a democracy should be about. And he was writing in that context with regard to all of the problems we see with human politicians, the vices, the corruptions, the flawed understanding of reality the factionalism and partisanship and toxic culture of negativity that pervades politics. A rational artificial intellect wouldn't be subject to any of those problems. So with regard to the spectrum of views, on the next slide, I illustrate aspects of the U.S. Transhumanist Party's position as it has been adopted by our members in the course of multiple votes from late 2016 through 2017 thus far. And first, I want to point out that the Transhumanist Party in the United States has a category called allied membership. And an allied member does not have to be 
eligible to vote in the United States, that individual can reside anywhere in the world, so potentially any of you could become allied members of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, as long as that individual can express a political opinion. And if a sentient artificial intelligence is ever developed or emerges and that entity is capable of expressing a rational political opinion, that entity would be welcome as an allied member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Furthermore, in version 2.0 of the Transhumanist Bill of Rights, which Professor Marchev kindly mentioned in his introduction, we have an extensive preamble that includes a hierarchy of sentience. And I'll discuss that a bit in greater detail later, but Article 3, Section 33 of our Constitution discusses essentially the recognition of rights for entities possessing level 5 or more advanced information integration, essentially on par with humans today when they are not aided by technology. And we recognize that any such sentient entities, including new kinds of sentient entities that may be discovered or developed in the future, shall be considered to be autonomous beings with full rights and shall not be made subservient to humans unless they as individuals pose direct, empirically evident threats to the lives of others. I think this is important because it could avert some civil rights struggles in the future if there do emerge such entities and they consider themselves to be sentient, but they encounter legal obstacles to their recognition, that could pose the potential for a lot of strife and a lot of conflict. And if we think about these issues in advance, we may be able to prevent such strife by delineating where those rights should be recognized. On the other hand, narrow AI systems like the ones that exist today, which would definitely be at level four or below in this hierarchy, should not be treated as rights-bearing entities. They should be treated as tools, the way machines, algorithms, and computer programs are today. Some of the more advanced ones might be treated the way non-human animals are today, and based on similar ethical considerations, that doesn't necessarily mean there shouldn't be any restrictions on how those entities are utilized or deployed, but the ethical considerations wouldn't extend to giving them the full scope of rights. And then also in Article 3, Section 16 of our Constitution, we do share an affinity with the perspective articulated by Scott Santens that eventually, at some point in time, automation and AI will progress to the point where we as humans will not need to labor for a living. And so at that point, there should be a robust, universal, unconditional basic income system in place in order to make sure that nobody suffers as a result of that transition. So on the next slide, I wanted to give a brief overview of what would be a sentient entity recognized as having rights according to the Transhumanist Bill of Rights version 2.0 in our expanded preamble that was adopted by a vote of our members. And level five information integration is defined as having awareness, a world model, a primarily subconscious self model, which all together imply sapience or lucidity, the property of being aware of one's own awareness of abstractions of one's own self. It involves a sense of self, complex learned behavior, the ability to predict the future emotional states of the self to some degree, and the ability to make motivational trade-offs. So we can all do that. And humans, even in a primitive, unaided state, can do that. And I think we would all agree that humans in such a state are deserving of rights. And the Transhumanist Bill of Rights simply states entities at that level of sophistication, no matter how they are constructed, if they're artificial intelligences, if they're uplifted animals, if they're extraterrestrials that we encounter at some future time, should also be recognized as having those rights, that those rights aren't the exclusive preserve of biological humans who happen to arrive on this world the way we did. So now we can move on to the next issue, which is that of religion and transhumanism, whether the two are compatible or incompatible. And Zoltan 
has been famous for criticizing organized religion extensively. His view is that because in particular of the teachings of a lot of organized religions that there is an afterlife, that takes the pressure off in the minds of many believers from the task of conquering death in this world and overcoming our physical mortality. And Zoltan believes that if that paradigm is broken, then we could focus more on the war against death rather than, uh, say, the wars that are fought with the militaries throughout the world. John G. Messerly, who is a well-known philosopher in transhumanist circles, has stated, the most important reason to abandon religious belief is religion's opposition to most forms of progress, from the elimination of slavery, the use of birth control and women's and civil rights, to stem cell research, genetic engineering, and science in general. Organized religion often opposes progress. So, his view is based on his understanding of history. I would say history is a bit more nuanced in that sense because there have been religious groups that were also at the forefront of these civil rights struggles that John Messerly mentions. A lot of the early abolitionists, the opponents of slavery in the United States, were Quakers or dissident Protestants. So, I would say the picture is a bit more sophisticated than that. And on the other hand, there are a lot of prominent life extension advocates and transhumanists who believe that religion and transhumanism are entirely compatible. Bill Andrews, who is a leading telomere biologist and very famous life extension advocate and a great advisor to the transhumanist party has stated multiple times that the Catholic Church has actually expressed support for his work on telomere biology and that he has had encounters with high-ranking members in the Catholic hierarchy who have actually told him that he was doing God's work through his research. Aubrey de Grey, who is not religious himself, has nonetheless made a compelling case that from the standpoint of a lot of the major religions of the world that should actually be seen as a sin not to pursue life extension and work on improving human health. He says that's because aging causes a lot of suffering and alleviating suffering is something the scriptures told was our duty. So the points that Bill Andrews and Aubrey de Grey are making, I think, relate to interpretation of religion and how transhumanists can make a lot of headway in convincing religious people not to abandon their religious beliefs, because that is extremely difficult to do with somebody who has been raised with a lifetime framed by a particular system, a particular worldview, but rather to show people that their religious beliefs do not conflict with the specific goals that we have in mind, like the pursuit of life extension or the embrace of other emerging technologies. And then there are, of course, various denominations of Christian transhumanists as well as transhumanists of other religions. I've seen some Islamic transhumanists. Uh, I've definitely seen a lot of Jewish transhumanists, Buddhist transhumanists. Reverend Christopher Benick is a well-known Christian transhumanist who makes the point that actually a lot of people in his congregation are using the fruits of transhumanism every day through their choices to embrace certain technologies. So he is encouraging Christians to participate in the transhumanist movement and also to understand that it is not just science fiction. These technologies have, in some respects, arrived today. So with regard to the U.S. Transhumanist Party position on the next slide, first of all, we strongly support the freedom of peaceful speech, whether it is religious, non-religious, or anti-religious. So in our desired society, all of these perspectives that I tried to present, including the disagreements among those perspectives, would be entirely free to be articulated. We strongly oppose all censorship, including censorship that arises out of any manner of identity politics or desire to avoid perceived offensive behavior. And our opposition to censorship is irrespective of the direction from which that censorship comes, whether it is 
censorship motivated by a desire to preserve uh, certain religious beliefs or a desire not to have those beliefs articulated. We think all censorship is bad. And furthermore, we welcome both religious and non-religious individuals who support life extension and emerging technologies. We recognize that some religious individuals and interpretations of religions may be receptive to technological progress, and if they are, it would be counterproductive not to embrace them as part of our movement because they're valuable allies. But on the other hand, we are opposed to any interpretation of a religious doctrine that results in the rejection of reason, censorship, violation of individual rights, suppression of technological advancement, and attempts to impose religious belief by force and or by legal compulsion. And there is unfortunately a deep history of these abuses uh, when it comes to organized religion. This is where Zoltan and John Messerly have very valid points that they have made. And the question and the challenge for us is, how do we take what is valuable about these religious perspectives and help all of humankind move forward in rejecting the dogmatic, censorship-oriented, rights-violating interpretations of religion? And then furthermore, of course, as the U.S. Transhumanist Party, we oppose certain specific cultural, religious, and social practices that violate individual rights and bodily autonomy. For instance, forced marriage, genital mutilation, and honor killings, irrespective of what justification is purported for these types of abuses. They are abuses. They do violate basic human freedoms. And to some extent, we don't care how they're justified. We consider them egregious, and an enlightened future society will be devoid of those abuses. So then on the next slide, I provide an overview of perspectives on the last subject area I'll discuss today, which is privacy. And Zoltan has also made the point that we are maybe approaching an era in which nothing will be private, in which there is massive surveillance, there is the ability to record pretty much any encounter, and it's not just extended to the government surveilling the population, it's also extended to private institutions. But Zoltan sees some hope in this as well, because the surveillance doesn't have to go one way from the top down. He points out that humans, ordinary people, can also use these technologies to surveil large institutions and keep them accountable. So there may be some checks and balances in this technological future. Gray Scott, who is a well-known futurist, he writes for the site Serious Wonder, has stated that today we live in a panopticon world and that the surveillance state that has emerged during the 20th century in the 21st century is becoming transformed into a self-surveillance state where a lot of people just voluntarily opt into significant losses of privacy. And he is also saying that this may eventually transition to a surveillance state. Surveillance is surveillance from the bottom up. And he sees privacy as becoming an antiquated notion because of cameras, sensors, other technological advances, as well as GPS, smart homes, energy harvesting, and biomedical tools. So the question then is, can these same emerging technologies, which could potentially limit or endanger individual privacy, also rescue privacy? Edward Snowden, of course, is perhaps the most famous privacy advocate today. He has stated that we should use these technologies to armor ourselves, and it doesn't have to be an extraordinary lifestyle change or something disruptive. It could be seamlessly integrated into our everyday lives. And I have an example of this. So this is my smartphone. You may notice on the camera to the smartphone, there is a little slider, and I can move the slider, and now the camera is open. It can record images and film, and now the camera is closed. And I just installed these sliders on the front and back cameras of my phone today, which enables me to 
make sure that I'm not being tracked visually without my consent unless I choose to actually turn on that camera and open that slider and record something with it. And that's a very simple but relatively new technology. And we can imagine a lot more sophisticated innovations that can protect individual privacy. Ryan Starr of the Transhumanist Party of Colorado, who is a prominent participant in our discussion, has also made the point that maintaining individual privacy is a crucial element in free society. And as our digital fingerprint becomes part of our notion of self, we need to figure out a more systematic way to maintain our personal privacy. And furthermore, there needs to be, from a policy standpoint, a discussion about to what extent does the information that we put out online become an extension of ourselves that we should have some rights of control over. For instance, if we put something on Facebook and we don't set it as completely public and accessible to the rest of the world, should that be considered perhaps still our personal property to that data that not just anybody can take without our consent, without our knowledge of how it is being used? And he makes the point that our electronic data should be treated as part of our bodily autonomy because of the extent to which our digital lives are now integrated into our everyday view of self. And then finally, Hani Fakuri of the Electronic Frontier Foundation has pointed out that history has shown that technology also has the ability to enhance privacy, and he uses examples of software like Tor and anonymous webmail servers that have helped political dissidents in authoritarian countries. He uses examples of encryption that protects both private trade secrets, but could also protect the privacy of individual communication against espionage by other individuals or by governments. And furthermore, he points out that there's nothing inevitable about technology endangering privacy. He says the only inevitability must be the demand that privacy be a value built into our technology. But of course, this is a contingent matter. Technologies can be built to endanger privacy. But if there's enough of a social push to protect the value of privacy, then we are going to have items like these little sliders on our phone cameras proliferate more. And then on the next slide, I provide the U.S. Transhumanist Party position on the issue of privacy, which is a position of strong support for individual privacy and liberty over how to apply technology to one's personal life. We hold that each individual should remain completely sovereign in the choice to disclose or not disclose personal activities, preferences, and beliefs within the public sphere. As a result, we oppose any mass surveillance or any intrusion by either governments or private institutions upon non-coercive activities that individuals choose to retain within their private spheres. And we emphasize this is an individual choice. So if somebody wants to put something out there for general public consumption, that is their freedom to do so. But if they wish not to, then they have the freedom to maintain a sphere of privacy. On the other hand, if they have put something into the public sphere, they should not be protected from peaceful criticism of the information that they choose to render public. So if somebody puts forth an idea and that idea is not well received, the originator of the idea can't resort to the concept of privacy to say, no, we don't want any criticism of that. Once it's out there, it is fair game. So... Finally, on the last slide, I would once again reiterate that anybody with the ability to form a political opinion may become an allied member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. If you go to our website and you go to the top bar of links, navigate to become a member, there is a simple membership application form that takes just a few seconds to a few minutes to fill out. There are three core ideals that have been formulated to be as broad and inclusive as possible while still describing essentially what it means to be a transhumanist of any of a wide variety of perspectives. And if you agree to the three core ideals, 
and provide your name and email address, you can become an allied member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. So with that, thank you very much for your time. I hope that this has provided some insights and a variety of perspectives for you to consider. And with that, I am open to any questions you might have. Speaking about the allied membership, I am an example. I am an allied member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party and participated in working out the bill the Transhumanist Bill of Right version 2.0, which, by the way, is hanging on the wall, together with several uh, important in the history of uh, transhumanism milestones. Uh, the public could read them, and of course they will be included in the uh, volume of our uh, journal, uh, next volume, which will be specially intended on the topics of um, longevity and transhumanism. All um, presentation from the previous two years and from this year, including your presentation of uh, guests, will be part of this uh, special volume. Of course, you will have the chance to read, think, uh, or edit your uh, materials on the base of the feedback you will receive. Uh, so that was my additional, uh, let's say, administrative addition to the process of the conference, just to remind to everybody, there is no point to make pictures at the moment because all files of all um, participants are already sent. The last came at 3 o'clock in the morning today, uh, but they are all available. We have a lot of um, video records, approximately 60 hours. From the RAD fest, I will uh, make a debrief uh, later on uh, today. But of course, we will uh, continue to discuss these uh, topics uh, in the Friday night seminars during the semester. So, just to remain that we are starting but not ending discussions for this semester. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, answer, to give the chance to everybody to ask questions or comments to Gennady's presentation. Please. Okay? Comments, questions to Gennady? Uh, our guest, to Gennady? Okay, I have a, I have a comment uh, or maybe a question. You can take it as a question. I, I'm not sure. Um, on some issues that Transhumanist Party, US Transhumanist Party, uh, sound uh, closer to, you know, um, to the to the private to the private rights of, of people in the, of the individuals. On some part, they are sort of on the public side of it. So I'm trying to I'm trying to not state left, left or right here because it's different. But still, uh, how do you see yourself in the current, let's say? Acknowledge already acknowledged spectrum, political spectrum, uh, widely in, in the world, in the world, left, right, and so on. I think that's a very good question. And in terms of the positions that have been adopted by the transhumanist party, what renders us unique and what enables us to stand apart from most of contemporary politics is precisely that we seek to transcend the traditional left-right political spectrum. We see that as a false dichotomy, an obsolete dichotomy that has run its course. Rather, we see the new dichotomy being one that FM 2030 distinguished as being between upwing and downwing. And as Virginia Postrel, a libertarian author, wrote in her book, The Future and Its Enemies, in the late 1990s, the distinction is between dynamist and stasist, the people who believe in continued progress and innovation and improvement versus the people who want to put the brakes on that and maintain some semblance of the status quo. Another way to frame that distinction is the distinction between open and closed. So you can see that in contemporary politics, a lot of politicians who represent themselves as being 
either from the right or from the left, actually advocate a closed perspective. For instance, closing borders to immigration or imposing special economic protections for jobs or for uh, certain favored domestic industries via protectionist tariffs. So that would be an example of the closed mindset, any kind of nationalism or nativism or left-wing identity politics that exists on a lot of college campuses would be an example of a closed mentality. On the other hand, an open mentality would be one that does value individuals for who they are and recognizes the tremendous scope of individual diversity and also recognizes the open-endedness of what an individual could become. So an open mentality would say, we are not defined by our origins. We are not defined by our nationality. We're not defined by what tribe somebody puts us into. We can improve ourselves, both through technology and through our own choices and through our use of reason and our moral decisions that we make. And the open mindset also embraces technological progress. It embraces a great deal of economic freedom, though it could also look at government policies that might ameliorate some bad consequences that can exist in human societies. So I would say also, contrary to the all too rigid left-right orthodoxies that exist in contemporary politics, the transhumanist party endeavors to be pragmatic in the sense that we see different solutions than have been traditionally proposed to various societal problems. And we see technology playing a role in those solutions. And potentially, we might not be able to anticipate from our present vantage point how a given social problem might be solved, but a future technological innovation might just be around the corner to solve it and we need to at least keep our minds open to the possibility that something very different and very unorthodox might actually be a way forward that improves many human lives. Okay. Professor Chubano, uh, Sofia University. Uh, I'm interested to know more about the institutional framework of uh, I consider, I think you, you have the minds of uh, transhumanistic society. Mm -hmm. Do you have it in mind? So your party is directing or creating that kind of society. In society, people became according to uh, formal and informal rules, according to norms. Uh, what are the norms of human society? Do you have some development? You should have some sense, uh, and particularly uh, since we discussed the problem of privacy, what would be the balance of privacy versus, uh, say, social power? What would be the common, uh, you know, because, well, these are uh, two controversial uh, issues of behavior, and people like to get private for their privacy, but they should also be careful for people. The rules of the regulations is my Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think it touches on a lot of important areas and areas that deserve continued discussion in the decades to come as we transition from our current paradigm, which is largely based on 18th century theories of government and governance, toward a transhuman view of institutions. And I think in order to really get to truly transhuman institutions, there needs to occur a lot of political experimentation where one can even iterate on many models of governance and see what works and see what doesn't in the context of new emerging technologies and then apply the successful results on a broader level. So what that means is there's not a one-size-fits-all framework that we can just impose on the world or on even a large 
country like the United States or uh, a country even the size of Bulgaria, because that would mean the cost of any particular experiment would be way too large, and it would be very difficult to get enough people's buy-in to participate in that experiment. So to that end, the Transhumanist Party supports experiments in governance like seasteads, which are floating modular platforms on the oceans, where you could have little segments, a platform containing one building or a handful of buildings whose owners can decide to float to a community and join with it if they like the rules of that community. And if some frictions happen, they could disassociate themselves from that community and float to a different one or try to govern themselves. And the idea would be then each of these relatively small autonomous communities could try out different modes of governance. And that would be a relatively limited controlled experiment. There could be other types of experiments as well, like special economic zones in certain countries, free cities that are being tried in certain jurisdictions, or micronations. The transhumanist party is supportive of any entity that declares itself a micronation and essentially has a reasonable way of maintaining that claim. And the reason why micronations are important is they illustrate to us what is possible and they offer a kind of critique of existing large scale governmental structures, a kind of little nudge saying, maybe you could do this better, or maybe you could do that better. And the hope is with all of these different experiments on the edges, the larger societies are going to see their results. And through some combination of existing processes and incremental change, adopt the results that work best. Now, I will give you my personal perspective, which I've tried to at least have characterize the spirit in which the transhumanist party approaches reform. I am not a political revolutionary in the sense that I do not want an uprising. I do not want riots, massive protests, blood in the streets, reactionary crackdowns against that kind of behavior. I would rather that change happen very peacefully, civilly, incrementally by people just realizing perhaps some aspects of the old system don't work. They need to be reformed in light of changes to technology, in light of changes to economic realities, and let's figure out a peaceful, amicable way to reform them. So with that in mind, I would say we have to start with the systems that exist right now and see what are the main aspects that can be reformed relatively quickly what are the barriers to technological advancement that can be lifted? And eventually what will emerge is a more transhuman looking form of governance, especially if we set up deliberately experimental zones where one can structure governance in dramatically different ways, again, entirely peacefully with the consent of all of the participants. And then the question of privacy and the balance to be achieved with regard to protecting individual privacy, but also making sure that, for instance, harmful acts that some people might commit under cover of privacy are not perpetrated. I think that's a challenge that exists in every era. In past eras, people in their private lives might have committed theft or murder or other kinds of vices. And it was considered desirable in societies at that time to have certain ways of catching those harmful acts or punishing those harmful acts. I don't think the problem is fundamentally different today or in the coming decades. It's just the technologies that would be used are different. So, for instance, I have no problem with targeted surveillance against terror suspects or suspects in real serious crimes. And the technologies for that kind of surveillance exist. What I and the Transhumanist Party have an objection to is indiscriminate mass surveillance that doesn't distinguish between somebody who is a legitimate suspect 
in some nefarious activity and an ordinary citizen. So this philosophy that the National Security Agency in the U.S. has articulated that in order to find a needle in a haystack, you have to collect the entire haystack is a deeply flawed point of view because by focusing the technology on the innocent or those who are overwhelmingly likely to be innocent, one actually dilutes the power of that technology to detect and to punish the guilty. So in my view, technology, as with the question of privacy in general, can be a double-edged sword. And the question is, how do we deploy it responsibly to protect the privacy of all those individuals who should have the presumption of innocence and who are probably just living their lives, while we can also hopefully use that technology against criminals and against people who would wish to do us harm. Thank you. I do have a question. Uh, hello, one more question. Uh, hello, I'm Dayan. Uh, my question was partially, partially answered, and it was, I'm going to fight for your ideas. Also, most big changes in human and transhuman history can come after revolution. And that was the question that you partially answered, more or less. And the second thing is, I wanted to develop uh, Angle's ideas. Uh, it comes with the uh, environmentalist movement also. I feel that uh, these parties, these movements are but to a certain time, because I think every party should be green and every party should be uh, providing the ideas of concrete. How do you feel about this? Yes, thank you for both of those questions. I will take the latter question first. So with regard to, for instance, environmental improvements, it is my view and the view of the Transhumanist Party that the best way to improve the environment is through further technological advancement. For instance, take the problem of climate change and if the use of fossil fuels is contributing significantly to deterioration in climates throughout the world and to, say, an increased frequency of natural disasters. What is the best way to transition away from fossil fuels? It is through better technologies of energy generation that are also more economical. So, for instance, solar power is becoming significantly more economical every passing year. And more and more of the electricity throughout the United States, at the very least, but in other parts of the world as well, is being generated through solar power. Likewise, Tesla has been a pioneer in electric vehicles, but after Tesla has set an example for creating high-quality electric vehicles with great safety records and a relatively long range, large automakers have come into the picture and have begun to roll out larger scale electric vehicle projects of their own. And this is an example of how through technological advancement, our environmental problems could be overcome. We could have cleaner technologies, we could have safer technologies with fewer negative external effects. And I think at that point, as you validly stated, a lot of people from a wide variety of political persuasions are going to say, yes, this electric car is great, not because of any ideological consideration, but because it is a good product that is superior to all of the alternatives. Likewise, these solar panels, a lot of people in Nevada, where I live, have begun installing solar panels on their rooftops because it can save them significant amount of money on their electricity bills. And those are examples where then you have a society-wide consensus or acceptance of certain better ways of doing things. I hope that the embrace of longevity likewise is going to become a universal human embrace and it won't just be politicians or members of the transhumanist party that articulate these ideals. Rather, as medicine, science, and technology progress, as the treatments to significantly extend healthy lifespans begin to be deployed in clinical settings, 
people of conventionally right-wing or conventionally left-wing perspectives, people from a wide variety of religions, are going to view them favorably just because those technologies can help improve their own lives and save the lives of their loved ones. So yes, the goal of the transhumanist party is to raise sufficient awareness of these issues to enable advocacy of these emerging technologies to become mainstream and eventually for these technologies to themselves be mainstream technologies. Now on your first question with regard to fighting for one's ideas, you stated that in your view most effective social change has come through revolutions of the historical violent turbulent sort. I would actually disagree with that in terms of thinking about what those revolutions actually produced. Of course, the various communist revolutions, which in some cases are still in living memory, have largely only produced chaos and destruction, a great loss of life, a great oppression of people's liberties. But even going earlier in history to perhaps the most benign revolution of them all, the American Revolution, what actually happened? The American colonists rebelled over some stamp duties, a three-cent tax on tea, some quartering of troops in their homes, and what they ended up with was tens of thousands of people dead, about a third of the population of the colonies that declared independence being forced to emigrate north to Canada because they disagreed with that decision, hyperinflation, massive economic collapse during the Revolutionary War, and ultimately what they got was a government that imposed far more taxes and far more restrictions on individual freedoms than King George III would have ever dared to do. So I will confess that if I were living in those times, I would have probably been a loyalist because I wouldn't have seen the kinds of abuses by the British Crown and Parliament to be worth fighting a war over. So in terms of my view of what actually enables effective social change to occur, it is largely technology when it is supported by the appropriate rational and moral frameworks of thought. The abolition of slavery is a very good example. The United States fought a needlessly bloody war to get rid of slavery, but in most parts of the world, slavery or serfdom went away because economic realities made it obsolete. Even, say, in Russia, the autocratic Emperor Alexander II abolished serfdom in 1861 completely peacefully, two years before Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in the United States. In Brazil, slavery was abolished peacefully in 1881. In Britain, the slave trade was abolished in the first decade of the 19th century, again, completely peacefully through an act of parliament. So I think the best examples of social change, the social change that occurs so seamlessly that perhaps it doesn't attract as much attention, but it is more long-lasting, more sustainable social change. The best examples are of peaceful change, change that occurs because the underlying realities of the society are no longer conducive to the old ways. And yes, that does require advocacy. That does require people like us to recognize that change is necessary. It won't just occur automatically. But I'm hopeful that with acceptance of transhumanism and emerging technologies, we will not have to fight a war. We will not have to protest in the streets. As I suggested to Zoltan, we could be the alternative to all those people protesting in the streets. We could be the ones who come in after the fact and say, let's get past all of this senseless toxicity and polarization, and let's just build our civilization from here on. Okay, thank you.